environmental DNA. <clears throat> so just what exactly is environmental DNA? And simply put, it's DNA released from an organism into the environment. All living things have DNA, and all living things uh, release that DNA into the environment. It arises from sloth cells, from skin or hair or scales, or through the intestinal tract. Um, broadcast spawners will release sperm and eggs into the environment that have DNA in it, or when animals die, they leave their remains also have a lot of DNA in it. And so <clears throat> these cells come off of the animal through the various different ways. And inside each of those cells, there are many copies of DNA. And that right there is what we analyze for when we do environmental DNA analysis. So taking a, a little bit deeper look inside the cell, um, you may remember from high school biology that uh, all cells have a nucleus where the bulk of the DNA is kept. And then the, they have these power plants for the cell called the mitochondria. They also have DNA inside them. Now, when we do analysis for an environmental DNA, usually we are targeting that mitochondrial DNA for a few reasons. One, because there are many more copies of the mitochondrial DNA compared to the chromosomes that reside in the nucleus. Um, so that makes it kind of a much more abundant target. When you're looking for a needle in a haystack, you, it's a lot easier to look for a thousand needles versus two needles. And <clears throat> also, because the mitochondria has its own membrane. As the cells are released from the organism and start to break down, it has this outer membrane that protects the cell, and then that erodes, and then the mitochondria have this additional membrane that will protect the mitochondrial DNA even longer. So the DNA is more stable, it's more abundant, and just plain easier to detect. Also, because the mitochondrial genomes are much, much smaller from uh, compared to chromosomes, like on the order of 16,000 bases for a typical mitochondrial genome to maybe uh, several million bases in a chromosome, uh, it, that is a much easier thing to sequence. And because of that, we have the mitochondrial genome sequences known for very many species on the planet. And because we have that sequence known, that's what we need to compare to in making our species identification. If we don't know the sequence, then we can't detect that organism because we don't know what we're comparing it to. So <clears throat> how do we analyze DNA? The first thing we do is we go out and collect a water sample or some other type of sample. And for a lot of our studies, it's, it's literally as simple as taking a tube and scooping some water off of the surface. Then once you have that sample, you have to concentrate the cells that are in the sample, either by filtration or centrifugation are the most common methods. And then once you have that concentrate, then you extract all the DNA from the sample. And the, the DNA is going to contain uh, the organism you're looking for. It's going to also have lots of bacterial DNA, lots of fungal DNA, and then because we can't see the DNA and it's in low copy numbers, the next step is to amplify the DNA that we're looking for to make millions of copies. And then because you can't see DNA with the naked eye, we use light to detect it. So how does that process work of amplifying the DNA and then detecting it? We use a process called quantitative polymerase chain reaction or qPCR for short. And if you imagine this is a DNA strand for your organism of interest, we put that DNA into a chemical reaction where we supply these short DNA molecules called primers. And if the primer matches the DNA sequence of our target organism, if that's present, then the chemical reaction will proceed and make copies of that DNA. <clears throat> 
If it does not match, then the DNA will not be copied. So that's how we selectively amplify only the DNA that we're looking for and ignore the rest. Now I said we use light to detect it. So the first step is amplification. The second step uses this probe. And it's another uh, strand of DNA with a couple of modifications. On one side, it has a fluorophore. So you hit it with a laser and it gives off some fluorescent light. And on the other side, it has quenchers that when they're in close proximity to the fluorophore, they absorb all of the energy that that fluorophore would be giving off. So when this probe is sitting in solution, it does not give off any light. But when it matches the DNA sequence as being amplified, the enzyme that is copying that DNA will cut this probe. And when that happens, the fluorophore is released away from the quenchers, and now it will start giving off light. And that's how we detect the DNA of our target organism. And it's key to remember that we will only get light if the primer sequence matches and the probe sequence matches. So if your primer sequence matches and the probe does not, you, you might get DNA amplification, but we won't detect it with the light because the probe also has to match. So that gets us some very specific tests that will only detect what we're looking for and nothing else. So sometimes it's helpful to take a look back at how some of this all started in the beginning. And it was microbiologists who first started using environmental DNA techniques. And they were using it to identify microbes in the soil and the water in the 1990s. Because before then, the way to do it was you'd squirt some water on a petri dish and you'd grow it and you'd get something that looks like this. And then they would use their microbiological techniques to look at it under the microscope and stain it and do some different chemical tests to identify what it is. But then some people had the idea of instead of going through all of this to figure out what microbes are present, why not just collect the DNA and I know what the DNA sequence is, so if it matches what I'm looking for, then I know that my microbe of interest is present. And then researchers started using it to identify toxic algal blooms in water samples. They identified fecal contamination in water supplies. They look for pathogens in the environment. And they can characterize complete microbiomes of what bacteria and fungi are in the soil or water that are supporting the food web above it. Then in the 2000s, uh, ecologists that studied vertebrates started using some similar methods where they mostly studied scat. So it turns out you can learn a lot from what comes out the back end. And researchers in Yellowstone would um, take DNA samples from wolf scat and then use that to determine how many wolves are in the park because obviously wolves are mainly nocturnal. Sometimes they're hard to uh, see and capture, so they may not um, have reliable methods for estimating their population size. but um, I'm sure you've all seen the book, Everybody Poops, and that includes wolves, and they can go out and find that and determine, you know, how many wolves are in that population. Another interesting study came out in 2003 where <coughs> uh, this endangered wombat was being preyed upon, and they had no idea what was killing the wombats, so they uh, didn't know how to protect them. And so they started collecting feces and analyzing those for wombat DNA. And they found out that there were some local dingoes that were decimating this endangered wombat population. 
So then that gave them the answer they needed to how they can save the wombats. Another interesting study was looking at owl feathers. So it's dangerous for people and for the birds to capture owls, or it can be, and um, if you can just go and find feathers, now you can do a genetic analysis on that owl without causing the animal stress from being captured and without um, risking people getting bitten or clawed from the owls when they were handling them. Um, in Norway, they were interested in determining if um, escaped rainbow trout from the hatchery system were um, breeding with the native populations. And so then they did DNA sequencing on some rainbow trout that they captured and identified where the escapees were come or came from based on the genetic code. And another popular study that is being done more and more is actually figuring out what animals eat by using uh, DNA-based methods to um, analyze feces and figure out what went through that digestive tract on a lot of animals. <clears throat> then in 2008, a group out of France uh, I believe were the first ones to start using it, it to just collect a water sample and determine if an invasive species, an invasive vertebrate species was present in ponds. And they were looking at American bullfrogs, which are invasive over in Europe. And they found that pretty reliably you could just go out and collect water samples and determine if this invasive species was present. And in the U.S., we adapted that in 2011, looking for Asian carp as they've been invading towards the Great Lakes. And there have been other, numerous other studies, including New Zealand mud snails, and um, it's kind of a growing field using environmental DNA to detect invasive species. And just to give you an idea, here's a publication timeline for research articles published each year from 1993 to current, you can see there's a very strong growing trend that eDNA is being researched more and more. Last year there were 158 environmental DNA articles published and 2017 it's only April and you can see we're well on our way to following that trend. So, how can you use environmental DNA? What's it good for? There's many different applications, but some of them could be to detect rare, cryptic, or elusive species. You can detect migration or spawning behavior for an organism that you're interested in studying. You can monitor species abundance changes in time for uh, managing populations. You can determine species assemblages in a given ecosystem. You can evaluate management action, uh, determine if it was successful or not. And you can actually collect DNA samples to create an archive record um, looking so that someday down the road you could look back in time and determine um, when different changes happened in a particular ecosystem. So along the lines of detecting rare, cryptic, or elusive species, this is kind of one of the things that was started out very early on in detecting the invasives, monitoring invasion fronts to get early detection to allow rapid response. So the idea is that not all species are easily captured with nets or other methods, but um, everybody has DNA and that DNA can't hide from you, it can't run from you. It, it, if it's there, you can find it. And it's also being used to survey for endangered species as well. And here's just a partial list of 
different species that are being studied with environmental DNA right now. And you can see pretty much all taxa are represented and it's a pretty widely applicable method. So wide, in fact, that even the most cryptic and elusive species could potentially be studied if they exist. There's a researcher in New Zealand who is going to use environmental DNA to test if the Loch Ness Monster is real. And I should mention that the USGS does not acknowledge or deny the existence of the Loch Ness Monster, and the USGS is not engaged in research to answer that question. But I thought this was an interesting story. <clears throat> so one caveat to detecting these rare species. Um, DNA will persist in the environment. And this group here found that when you put sturgeon in a pond and then take those sturgeon out, you can still detect their DNA that they left behind for one to two weeks later. But research that we found here is that uh, the DNA source aside, carcasses, slime, and bird feces that may have been preying on your species of interest can actually keep putting DNA into the environment for a long time, actually out for a month or longer. So when you get these rare detections for rare species, you have to um, be aware of what are the potential sources of that DNA, not just is there a fish present or um, if a carcass gets put into the water or if there are birds that are flying around scavenging and uh, roosting above the water, then you have to be aware of that and be smart about how you collect your samples and interpret those results. So one example of using environmental DNA for early detection of invasive species. We did a study here in Wisconsin with New Zealand mud snails. So New Zealand mud snails were first detected in Wisconsin in 2013 in, in Black Earth Creek. And as you can see from the picture on the right here, these are tiny and they're really easy to spread around without even noticing because they're about the size of a grain of sand. And um, so they get spread around, unfortunately, a lot by trout fishermen because they like to inhabit the streams that trout fishermen like to fish in. And because they're so tiny and so hard to notice, they can just attack or grab onto their waders and hitch a ride to the next spot. So in 2014, we worked with the Wisconsin DNR to do a pilot study to evaluate how well envir environmental DNA can detect these mud snails. And so at each of these stars along the river here is where we collected samples. And here in 2013, this is the site where the New Zealand mud snails were first identified. And part of the pilot project was to, one, find out can we detect New Zealand mud snail DNA at this site and potentially some distance downstream as the DNA migrates through the water? And um, can we use it to find out if they're spreading? And lo and behold, when we got the DNA results, we found some really high DNA activity at this other site upstream. And we actually found a second infestation site upstream of the original site. So that was kind of a DNA, eDNA success story there, mm -hmm. where we were able to use the environmental DNA results and clue in the Wisconsin DNR who went out looking and actually found those mud snails. So because of our initial success with the pilot project, um, we worked with the 
Mississippi River Basin Panel to test uh, 46 sites throughout Wisconsin, Iowa, and Illinois at different trout streams to see if New Zealand mud snails were invading there as well. And fortunately, we found no, they were contained to Black Earth Creek. So that was good news. Unfortunately, bad news is uh, just this year or last year, recently, Wisconsin DNR did discover a second site where New Zealand mud snails have um, been in, found. But uh, this type of activity is good to know because um, they can raise awareness about it to the anglers so that they know they're not spreading them around. And a good thing is an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure because once they're present, they're really hard to get rid of. And so this type of activity is really valuable. So my second uh, topic of how environmental DNA can be used are de detecting migration or spawning behavior. So this is from a publication our group had in 2016 on the Wabash River in Indiana. And on the y-axis is the DNA concentration in uh, copies per microliter and then log transformed. And on the x-axis are a number of tagged individuals. So this study was uh, looking at big-headed carp. And in that river system, we have about 300 big-headed carp that are tagged with telemetry receivers. And um, we had recorders out in the water to detect when they moved past a particular point where we were sampling. And you can see that on this day where there were 12 tagged fish moving past, it had actually um, a thousand times more DNA than at this on this day where at the same site there were only four tagged individuals that went across. And you can see Remember, this is a log scale on the y-axis. So it's actually a really strong relationship where there's more fish moving through an area, we get more DNA. And this is potentially useful in several situations. Uh, one could be for timing of opening and closing a barrier, like a dam, for instance. So if you know, like, say sturgeon have to migrate upstream to an area for spawning. And if you know when the sturgeon are moving through, you can time it to have your dam open when the sturgeon are doing their spawning run or and then close it when they're done. Or if you have an invasive that's moving through, you can try and close it when they want to move through and then open it when they're no longer interested in spawning. And then also, if you are working closely with the lab and can get uh, quick turnaround results, you can actually detect their spawning behavior and then send uh, people out to disrupt that spawning behavior from with one method or another. Or if you're detecting uh, spawning activity for an endangered species, you might uh, limit people's use in that area to let let that species uh, continue spawning uninterrupted. And in the case of invasive species, you could find out that they are migrating to a particular area and that might trigger a control action to go in and fish them out or remove them some in, through some other methods. Another potential application would be to monitor abundance changes over time. So more and more researchers are showing this really strong correlation where as you have more fish density or biomass on the x-axis, you're getting more DNA on the y-axis. So there's a really good relationship. More fish, more DNA. Less fish, less DNA. The problem is that the 
eDNA concentration in the water is going to be dependent on the rate at which the DNA is being released minus the rate at which the DNA is degraded. And based on a lot of factors, chiefly being um, how abundant the species is and how much DNA they're putting in the water, um, it'll form an equilibrium that you can measure. Now, many different things can factor into um, how quickly the DNA degrades or how quickly the DNA is accumulating, such as pH, temperature, food availability, seasonality, turbidity, UV exposure. This is all a really complicated process that is not completely well enough understood that we could just, you know, go out and collect a water sample and say, oh, there's X number of thousand fish in that river. That, that's not possible. But if you're looking, taking kind of a longer perspective and all other things being equal, like you go out when the water is about the same temperature, about the same pH, same time of year, same sort of weather, you can collect comparable samples and say, okay, this population is increasing or this population is decreasing. And potentially that could be very useful in setting like fishing regulations so that um, people know that, okay, this population is increasing, so we can probably take some more fish out of there, or this population is decreasing, we should think about scaling back some of that activity. But uh, all that is very useful for setting um, informed science-based policies. Another potential use for environmental DNA is determining species assemblages. So just like this here is a 2D barcode that just encodes for some letters and has meaning if you have a scanner and a program that codes it for you. We have instruments that will read the DNA and inform us of what that sequence is and we can compare it to known sequences to determine what fish are in this water and can somewhat gauge relative abundance as well, but mostly identifying um, what different species are present and kind of taking like a, a broad picture uh, based on this DNA barcoding. Another application of environmental DNA is to evaluate management actions. So if you're controlling invasive species, you want to be able to come back sometime down the road and test, did we, did we get them all? Did we get most of them? Did we barely make a dent? Or if you're restoring natural habitat, you want some method of evaluating, okay, are we doing a good job? Is whatever species we're trying to help out, are they recovering? Are they holding steady? Are they declining? Um, in both of these cases, you can use environmental DNA um, just like um, in, you would do here, monitoring abundance changes over time, to evaluate success or failure of these efforts. <clears throat> and another potentially useful way to use environmental DNA is we go to all sorts of trouble collecting these eDNA samples and extracting the DNA out of it, analyzing for a particular species that we're interested in. Then we save it because someday down the road, I don't know when, but uh, somebody is going to want to look at a particular location that we studied and be like, gosh, I wonder how was the spectacle case muscle, for example, doing in that river back in 2013? Well, unless you were actually sampling for it, you, you have no way to go back and know. But the, you can see these tiny tubes here are pretty small and pretty easy to store. You can store them frozen or you can dry them down and store them at room temperature. And it's 
potentially a really valuable resource to have these samples to go back in time and look like if we have a new invader come in, go back and look at samples to find out when, when did that invader come, when did we first detect them, and try and figure out how did they get there, what, what are we going to do next. That's all very useful information to have. So that's kind of a broad look at how environmental DNA is being used right now. Uh, there's, of course, with any new technology, there's being further development done. And one thing that we're following up on is called high-throughput sequencing. So if you imagine DNA sequencing gets the sequence of a particular DNA strand, and you can compare that to um, a, a database of different DNA sequences and determine, all right, that DNA strand came from this species. Well, high throughput sequencing can analyze simultaneously millions of strands of DNA. And so you, in one analysis, you can look at potentially all fish or all mussels or all bugs that are present in a sample. And so developing this technology to get that kind of data out of a simple water sample is very powerful and that's something that um, we've been working on for a while and there's been a lot of uh, good developments in. And even like um, if you have a, a muddy sample that has a whole bunch of fish larvae and bugs and stuff crawling around in it, you can imagine the olden days people, may, and maybe not so olden days, because people still do this, of just picking through all that stuff and painstakingly identifying every single bug or fish larvae that's in that sample. That takes a lot of work. And um, depending on how degraded it is or um, other factors, there's room for error with that method. But if you get a DNA sequence, you know what that sequence is and know no one organism can fake the DNA sequence of another, so you have pretty, pretty good confidence in that identification in looking at that. So we're working on methods for um, collecting next generation sequencing or high throughput sequencing samples from, from this type of sample as well to analyze them through genetic means. Obviously, we want to refine our formula here, find out better how much does pH affect the degradation rate, how much does temperature affect the sheddings rate, um, what's the contribution of food availability, better understanding the organisms we're studying, better allows us to use this tool to get uh, estimates of how many of them are out there. So fishermen didn't just build a net one day and say, okay, I'm going to go out and catch some fish. No, they, they built a net and they tried some different methods and refined it and made it better. And now we're doing the same thing. Another future direction is adding some automation. So this here is basically a molecular laboratory in a can. Um, and it will robotically collect a water sample, extract the DNA from it, do qPCR analysis on it, and then uh, radio wherever and tell them what the results are. In, the Great La in Lake Erie, actually, researchers at the Great Lakes Sciences Center are using this technology to look for microcystin buildup uh, upstream of Toledo so that next time there's a big microcystin bloom, they can give them early warning and potentially they don't have to go for a week with no water in an entire city. So that's really valuable technology. Um, there are Re underwater automated vehicles that can go out and collect samples in the deep or out 
way out away from shore where people aren't don't necessarily want to go for safety reasons or for the time of getting out there, they can send these out and collect the samples and get the data that way. So that's some very exciting technology coming up. And of course, enabling citizen science. You know, there's there's only one of me and you know, hundreds or tens of thousands of colleagues that can, can do this sort of activity, but if we can simplify the process so that uh, average ordinary citizens can take our technology out into the stream or the lake or whatever environment they are interested in protecting and to do the analysis and then bring that data back to a scientist um, that is potentially very powerful where um, people can go out to a lot of places and get a lot more done that a scientist themselves can't necessarily do. And that allows for much uh, bigger picture questions to be answered and um, you can have a greater impact that way. And that's my presentation, so I'd quickly like to acknowledge my uh, team here at the Upper Midwest Environmental Sciences Center, John Amber, Grace McCullough, Craig Jackson, Teresa Schreier, Nick Schlosser, Yur Lor, Matt Hoogland, mm -hmm. Stacey Kageyama, and Tarek Tajiwi. And I'd also like to acknowledge my partners and funding sources. We collaborate as much as possible mm -hmm. with uh, the states, different universities, and even private industry. And we couldn't do this without funding. A lot of these projects were funded by the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, Great Lakes Fisheries Commission, the Legislative Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resources. And also I'd like to thank you for your attention. And here's my contact information as well if you have any follow-up questions and I guess uh, Candice, you can open it up to questions now. Thank you.